Hi, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Good? Good, I hope. All right. So, um, my name is uh, Jub Tan. I'm the managing partner for Plug and Play in Asia Pacific. Uh, for those of you interested in Plug and Play, join us at our booth here today. We are kicking off our supply chain program. Um, so, I'll be moderating the next panel. And without further ado, uh, let me introduce my three panelists and have them join us on stage. Um, Shumei from Azul World, um, Michelle from Aurum Group, Hamza from RHL Ventures, please. Okay, I think we're starting a little bit early. Um, so today, uh, for the next 30 minutes or so, um, we will be talking about family ventures, family offices, uh, family venturing, um, traditional or other types of businesses getting into startup-related investments. Um, maybe just to kick it off and as a bit of an introduction, uh, Plug and Play does a lot of different things today, uh, but a lot of people do not know that at the end of the day, we're actually a family office ourselves. Uh, we started investing uh, 20 years ago, 1998, and from then to now, we are still investing funds essentially from the same family office. So we've, we have, um, in a sense, a good tradition of, um, of investing. Um, a joke that our founder likes to give, in fact, uh, because their previous businesses are very traditional. And from, they range from commercial real estate to Persian rugs uh, to even the bottled water business. So one joke that our founder still makes today is that we make our money dollar by dollar, you know, selling water, um, and then we invest it 50,000, 100,000 at a time. So it's like, hopefully he will see some returns at some point. Um, but I think that, um, that perhaps sets the stage a little bit. So we'll break this panel into roughly three parts. First, we'll, do, we'll talk about, uh, we'll do introductions uh, to get a sense of where the panelists are from, uh, what are the businesses that they are running, and why are they investing. And then we'll talk a little bit about the investments part, and then we'll have a little bit of a call to action at the end, um, advice, questions from the audience. So, sounds good? So with that, maybe we'll start here. Please. Hi, um, my name is Shumei, and I represent my family investment um, office, uh, Azul Wall. We're based here in Singapore, but we do have quite a diverse um, bunch of investments. So as a family office, I think our primary concern is firstly um, risk, pre um, risk um, sorry, wealth preservation, which includes risk management. So most of our assets are actually, you know, uh, invested in liquid um, bankable assets, which gives us, you know, income and cash flow. So we then use that income to invest in things that we are both uh, interested about and are exciting to us. Um, some of the projects that I've invested in are, I've if you're wondering why there's a photo of chickens behind me, it's I have a farm in Africa. Um, we're really big into agriculture. Uh, and recently also we've invested in a um, local telemedicine company called Doctor Anywhere. And um, yeah, I think we'll talk about the rest of the investments later. Michelle? Sounds good. Michelle? Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm fourth generation family business leader, part of the Warhub group. Um, so we're 91 years old now, primarily real estate and construction. Um, I run four businesses. Orem Land is a property development business. Orem Investments is mainly in traditional like liquid financial instruments as well. But more recently, we've gone into venture capital um, as, a, as a very strategic for strategic reasons to try to stay at the forefront of uh, developments in the real estate industry. So we really look at uh, prop tech um, startups. Um, but we didn't know any startups. We didn't really know any VCs. Although through Collision 8, which is a co-working space that I founded two years ago um, with my co-founder, John Tan, we got to know the right startups and actually um, have made a direct investment in the startup from an introduction through a Collision 8 member and about to make a second investment. Um, where we, th How we choose the startups we invest in is do we understand the business model? Do we think we can add value to those businesses? Do we have the right um, knowledge, connections to help grow them? Um, so more from a strategic, synergistic point of view and not really from a financial returns point of view. Um, 
Yes, so we're very new to our journey. We've also recently started looking at impact investing, so Shume is part of the inspiration um, behind that to try to combine our uh, so CSR initiatives with the um, investment side. Thank you. Hamza? I um, basically started RHL Ventures about two and a half years ago, and it was following a trend of a lot of my peers who wanted to take the next step into investing. So if you look at the second generations between the different families, whether it's in Thailand, whether it's in Malaysia, all my friends wanted to do something. They all wanted to come out their own family businesses, but at the same time, they can't come out fully because everyone, whether it's the sons and daughters of, of the businesses, all need to still play a part in the businesses and all had, but everyone wanted to invest outside it. So what happened when we started RHL is we grouped together four different families across different corporates in Malaysia, whether it's from manufacturing, property development, dev care services, um, and also consumer, and we started investing together. And that's how it started. We invested across different sectors, but at the same time, always keeping in mind that strategic angle towards the different corporates that were under our umbrella. And if you look into whether it's manufacturing and AI, or there's property and Michelle and prop tech, that's a lot of trends and um, where the real world, the brick and mortar world and the tech world are merging. And you see that's why there's more capital and more interest from the families coming in. And that's what's resulting into, I mean, that's where you get the grabs of the war at the end, where capital has flown in at the early stage. And now you see even the big funds like KKR, Warburg Pinkers all coming to Gojek. You see Grab, Midway is going in. So you see a convergence of the traditional investing world and also the VC type slash family investing world. So I think that's been very interesting as we grow RHL to become where it is. Great, thank you for the introductions. Um, so we're starting to see some questions come in as well. So I'll weave them in as we, as we go along. Um, I think um, one of the themes, um, one of the key, di there are many differences between like a traditional VC fund or an angel investor or, um, or an accelerator that's investing for returns uh, versus family offices, um, as you've already mentioned a little bit. How do you... Um, how do you look at the investments? Yes, they, they, they should have a strategic purpose, but um, when it comes to time horizon, when it comes to um, whether this could be profitable or it could not be, or you know, can you uh, talk more a little bit more about that? Oh, anyone? Perhaps I have a go. Um, so you asked about time horizons. I think that is quite a unique differentiating factor with, when it comes to family businesses and family offices because we don't think in 10 years, we think in generations. So for us, firstly, it's not, like I said, it's not really profit driven. It's not we're looking for financial returns, but we're looking for new um, businesses that can add value to our, the wider group that we can, we can be part of their journey and then they become part of our journey too. So. Um, it's a very, very long time horizon that we're in it. We're not looking for exit strategies, actually. Just to add to that, in terms of the strategic angle, so I think a lot of startups usually look at to either uh, investors either from a financial or a strategic angle, right? And as you get bigger, uh, the strategic angle plays a more important part in terms of scaling your business. If your business is worth $10 million, um, you may think it's important to keep as much as equity as possible, but at the same time, when it's $100 million, you're creating a much bigger pool for yourself and also for your investors. So when a strategic investor comes in, and, all, and, and, and in times you may have a bit tougher terms than a pure, pure financial investment, but just to give you a quick example, like one of the startups we invested in, they did healthcare tech. Basically by opening up the corporates that um, are under our umbrella, we helped increase their number of users from 30,000 to 60,000 within six months. So these are the kind of things that a strategic ang uh, angle or strategic investor can bring into your startup. So uh, I, I think everyone's, a lot of startups I see have always been very inflexible in terms of terms or in terms of ways of negotiating. I think once you create a bigger pool and there's a win-win situation for both the startup and the investor, that's where you get the biggest value. And that's where you get to become a unicorn later on. Um, for us, when we do direct investments into startups, we tend to take um, a significant stake or at least be the anchor investor for that round. And so what that means is that it's really important for us to be you know, close to the founder, especially close to the senior management team. So because of that, you know, it also depends, time horizon depends obviously on how the company is yeah. doing, right? And because you're close to the team, you, know, you kind of have like insider information in that, in that way. But also what's equally as important is valuations. So for example, if valuations are looking a bit frothy, 
and you know they you don't really think that the company has a strategy to back up that growth then you know as a family office we won't hesitate exiting as well okay okay so let's let's dive a little bit into specifics right maybe um, talk about one great investment and one bad investment or if they're all great then just talk about one great one anyone and their experience uh, working with the with the startup well, I've only made two investments, about to make a third. Um, the one that I'm most excited about is Hamlet, the co-living startup. Um, I was introduced to them in September, October last year, and we led the seed round in November. And since then, we've helped them treble the number of members that they have and more than double their revenues in like the last 10, 10 months. Mm -hmm. And that's through making all the right introductions or opening up like, our Rolodex and um, vouching for them, introducing them to various landlords uh, and, and connections, not just in Singapore, but in Thailand, in Hong Kong, in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and we can only do that because we know them. We know the founders, we understand, we trust, that we put our names behind them. And that actually does change a lot um, of how they're perceived in the market. You know, we lend that credibility to them. So I'm very excited about what they're doing. I believe in their business model. Um, it's something that we wanted to do ourselves, but when we were introduced to them, I thought, great founders, great business model, let's back these guys instead. Um, so, yes. So, doubling <laughs> revenues and opening up new markets. That We will consider that a great one for a first investment. Right? Shumei, maybe? Um, well, the first investment that we ever did into startup was in 2001, which is possibly the worst year ever. And the reason Quite for awesome. that is my dad had found this... Um, startup that came out of like an NTU incubator and they were focusing on wireless surveillance technology at that point of time and because our previous family business was actually in port operations so we found quite a bit of you know interesting synergies to be had with that company and so my dad had a very um, you know important role to play in the company's growth as well uh, today it's one of the leading providers of wireless surveillance um, and it provides um, uh, solutions to like all our public networks in Singapore uh, a few years ago, Panasonic had taken over quite a significant stake in it, and um, at that point of time, had represented about a two times return uh, on you know on our investment. Yep. Double revenues, two times returns. That's good, Hamza. Since everyone's talking about good investments, so I think as an investor, <laughs> if I make hundred percent of investments that are good, I'll be lying, right? So, I mean, one of the big things that institutional investors look for are loss ratios. So, I think for an investor, you're always about also managing the downside of your investment. So for one of the investments we did, uh, we actually, it was actually a six-month convertible bond. And usually in a VC world, people don't really redeem the bond. People just roll it over. So when, and what happened was we didn't feel comfortable with the business after investing for about six months. And we actually redeemed the investment. So you got the capital back. You get the interest on top of it. But at the same time, the other investors were like, you redeem the bond? It's impossible, right? In right. A, it's an, especially in a, in, a, in a VC or startup world. So I think as an investor, you still have to be realistic, whether it's paring down your losses or actually just like recouping your gains and just being realistic about making money. It's not always about waiting till the end and getting the IPO or exit within seven to 10 years. Yeah. And, and for us, um, you know, I like to say that um, it's a hit-driven business, right? For those of you that are, are old enough to buy compact discs or CDs, if you remember a CD, right, an album, if you, like, if you really like one song, you like another two or three songs, and you don't remember the next five songs, it's a good CD, right? It's a good purchase. So it's a hit-driven business, a portfolio business. Um, okay, great. So let's talk a little bit about um, the startup ecosystem in general, because we are looking at uh, local, regional, international deals as well. Any comments on, on what you are seeing out there? Based on my experience, in every country, it's very different. Whether it's, so I've been to Manila a month ago, I've been to Jakarta two weeks ago, and every, every country is very, very different in terms of the startup ecosystem. If I look at Indonesia, you're talking about a lot of very e-commerce related or uh, consumer related plays, and they can scale up very quickly. So either you scale up, you become one of the top three guys, or you die out. You look at Singapore and Malaysia, I, I look at these two markets as either funding markets or, or markets that you can grow your businesses sustainably. Given the smaller populations and given the relatively higher GDP per capita and sophistication of the investors and the people itself, um, you generally spend a bit more 
time building the businesses and building uh, execution capabilities, but the market is not there and the market is overseas. In certain countries like Manila and um, even Vietnam, the consumer market is there, but you're talking about taking very early stage risk. So if, as an investor, if you're willing to take that type of risk, um, you can get probably a very high return, but given for us where we invest mostly, mostly in a growth stage, so Series A, B, C, generally Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore are our top markets. Um, I've not invested regionally, it's just started on this journey, uh, but I did ask, so we have not just gone direct into uh, the startups, we're also investing with some of the VCs like Monks Hill, um, mm -hmm. NSI Ventures, now Open Space and Cocoon Capital, so we're tapping on their experience, their expertise, their knowledge, their advice uh, to make smart decisions, and if one of the first things I asked them um, last year when we were starting on this journey is, is there too much hot money? Because that's what I feel like. There is a lot of hot money chasing startups and valuations. I mean, to begin with, when, when you're looking at seed stage, the, the valuations are very, you know, what Hi. kind of multiple? Just pick a um, There's a very little basis. Um, and, but they said, no, they don't feel like the market is too frothy at the moment. And actually, there are still a lot of good startups, good good picks. Um, and I think being from the family office side, because we are... Well, but maybe you, you've got a few people more to answer to, but we can be very selective in the startups. We, we're not under pressure to, mm -hmm. to have to constantly invest. And I think maybe that's why we've been, um, also could be beginner's luck, mm -hmm. but um, so far doing Beginner's okay. luck is the best, you know, it's the best. Yeah. <laughs> How long can we hold on to that? No. <laughs> we always say we like to be lucky rather than good. So many of our, our, of our when you invest uh, from day one, you have no idea whether this company will survive in three years or IPO in seven years. Uh, more often than not, well, some of them just will not make it. Yeah. Um, we like to find sweet spots, um, sweet. you know, opportunities um, like more B2B, um, you know, startups. For example, we also do invest in VCs and one of the interesting ones is actually based in New Zealand and they focus on, you know, B2B SaaS um, startups. And you know that gives us quite an interesting opportunity because if you compare the valuations, you know, to you know places like Singapore, even Israel, um, it's a lot more uh, attractive. But at the same time, because being based in New Zealand, they get all the um, expertise there, but they go on a global uh, scale. Um, you know that presents us with with exciting opportunities. Also, I guess the next hot thing is agri-tech. I think um, the next panel, they're going to be talking about that. It's because I do quite a bit of work in Africa, you know, um, booming population and less people on the farms. So finding ways to automate, um, you know, food production is obviously something that is very exciting, also here in Singapore. Right, right. I think as, especially as a develop, fast, uh, quickly developing region, a lot more consumers and businesses are coming online. Very relevant. Um, so. Mixing up some of the questions a little bit, um, when, you, when you look at a startup investment, how much of it is your gut or your heart you know, telling you to invest and how much of it do you rely on, let's say, data or numbers or what's out there? How do you evaluate these investments? Okay, personally to me, investing is both an art and a science. I'm sure a lot of people speaking today have said the same thing. So from our investment approaches, given that you're going more in the growth stages of Series A, B, C, there is some numbers to back the performance up, but at the same time, you do have to input some assumptions in, in terms of growth for the next couple of years. So that's the hope portion that um, Jude was talking about. So when you're talking early stage, it's a bit about the numbers, but at the same time, the big part of it is the entrepreneur himself, whether he'll screw you over in 12 to 24 months or whether he'll just run away and start a new business later on. So that's more of spending time, cross-checking, just also having a, a gut instinct on the guy itself, or guy or girl itself to see if they're able to execute. Given that the partnership is not only for a year, it's going to be at least five to seven years in general, this, this sort of factors are quite important. Yeah. Um, we've done it both ways. The, the most recent investment, pure gut, didn't even look at their financials. Two meetings, two hours. Um, Why did you like them so much? It was a very simple business model. I got it straight away and I thought, you know, we can add a lot of value. Um, I brought one of the other directors to the second meeting and 
that was an hour long meeting and uh, they were they said they would have to make space for us because they were oversubscribed already but they thought we have strategic value to add mm -hmm. so he said how much time do you need i said half an hour so he asked them to leave and then came back and <laughs> made a few quick. phone calls and yeah so that was pure gut whereas our first one the investment in hamlet we definitely did a lot more work a lot more due diligence we did background checks on the founders um we did deep dives into their books um full audit it was a bigger ticket uh, some it was also the first time we were doing it so we felt like we had to be thorough and really you know understand um, so yeah we have done it very differently okay okay uh, definitely I think it's more gut and you know what we, what excites us mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to attribute evaluation to you know early stage businesses um, and more often than not we're presented with oh well you know the similar company raised that amount so therefore our valuation should be like that for, um, thank you. For any startup, any investors out there, uh, any startup that's less than a year old, they're showing you their financials, they are just projections. Projections are just projections, okay? So we are coming to the last few minutes, so we'll start to wrap up. Uh, for the aspiring uh, businesses, uh, family officers, and investors out there, um, given that, you know, I think in the last 10 years, regionally, globally, Silicon Valley, Southeast Asia, it's been boom times, right? Whether it's on property, financial markets, etc. Um, if someone out, if folks out there are looking to start getting into investments, any advice? Um, how should they do it? Should they do it at all? Should they leverage themselves to do it? Should they, you know, invest off balance sheets? Any advice? Investing in startups? Yes. Definitely off balance sheets. Um, not in, in not leveraging. Um, diversification is key, and so yeah, you know, don't um, put too many eggs in one basket. Spread the seeds, and you know, definitely invest in like Michelle said, um, things that you businesses that you understand um, and that you can obviously see potential in. Yeah. I think if you're new to startup investing, then definitely you find businesses industries that you know and understand are familiar with, because otherwise it's of, you know, taking baby steps and. I would say definitely don't leverage to, to invest. Use the spare money. Treat it like a, a little bit like gambling. It's a learning, right? It, it is gambling. Yes, it is a bit of gambling, yes. So after two and a half years of starting my own thing, I would say if you want to start your own investment house, think twice. It's not as easy as it seems. It's very time consuming. So, I mean, usually I would recommend anyone who wants to do their own thing, Get your subject matter expertise first, whether it's training in a fund house or training in a VC, and learn the ropes first before you jump into your own thing. Because if you're going to dedicate your whole life, soul, personal life, as extra to, the, to your idea or to your business or to your investment, you need some sort of expertise to back it up. And I think you'll soon realize, you know, whether you invest 25,000, 250,000, or 2.5 million, they all demand the same time, the same amount of time. Okay, so perhaps uh, finally to wrap up, um, for the startups out there that are looking potentially to approach you guys for investments, um, what are you looking for? Is there something in particular that you're looking for? Any advice to startups that are coming to you, specific to your businesses or interests? <laughs> we are looking, we have space to, for another maybe two direct investments um, this year. Uh, we are not, because we don't have a dedicated team like Hamza, it's basically me and I have three other businesses. So it's very much I rely on like the community at Collision A to bring good startups to me. So if you're not getting through direct to me because I'm not very good with my LinkedIn and all that, go to one of the Collision A members. That's how I meet all my startups. <laughs> um, because I trust their judgment because I'm new to this as well. And so they, they become a bit of a, a filter checkpoint mm -hmm. for okay. me. Okay, great. Sure. Um, definitely scalability, um, you know, be it within the segment or geographical. And the other thing that's, you know, important to me as an investor when I look at investments is who are the other investors, you know, because if they're anything like us, we don't view ourselves as financiers, you know, we're more like strategic uh, partners. So having a good investment team is equally as important as, you know, having a good idea. Okay, great. Hamza? So basically, I do get about five to ten startups meeting me every week. So you do get kind of a startup fatigue or a founder fatigue after most work weeks. So 
in general, what I look for now in terms of a founder itself, other than obviously the numbers, the growth story, the idea, and so on, is the ability to execute, and the ability to execute whether it's within your business model or within outside or being flexible with your business model to execute a business. A lot of founders talk a very nice, very rosy story, but you ask like, hey, you've executed, like you've done this business, you've done work with this client, how much money do you make from this client? And when the numbers come out, you're like, oh, you only make, let's say, instead of $100,000, you only make $10,000 with this client. And the numbers, the numbers will tell the story whether you can execute or not. So there's, nowadays, there's way too many startups. There's obviously a lot of I mean, incubation programs. There's a lot of accelerators. So the volume is not an issue, right? It's just finding the quality within those startups. So I would say don't try to paint a rosy story about your company because in the end, you'll be found out. Whether it's, so I have my analysts who, who actually go through like Facebook profiles, LinkedIn profiles. It gets quite stalkerish, but if you lie about something, you get found out for sure. And in this world, there's no way with social media, with co-living, co-working, there's just way too many data points that you can find something out about a person or an individual or a business. So I would say don't bullshit and just show what's real. Yeah. Yeah. To we, add on to we that. We stalk as well. Please, please. <laughs> Because, you know, you said, like, startups want to pitch, want to show their best sides. But actually, what interests me is, tell me where your weaknesses are. Tell me where your challenges are. And tell me how I can help you with those. That gets me a lot more interested than just, you know, give me projections, which, as you said, they're only guesstimates, right? So, yeah. Okay, I think um, with that, thank you very much. Shumei, Michelle, and Hamza. A round of applause, please. Thank you so much.